Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to Brunch with Brent. Uh, I'm so pleased to be joined today by Nerdsy Sanchez. Nerdsy, how you doing? Hello. I am doing really well because I am in sunny California and it is a beautiful day here today. <laughs> nice. I will admit that I'm in northern Ontario and we're supposed to get a lot of snow. So uh, a little bit of uh, maybe the opposite, but I'll be thinking of you. That sounds nice, too. Well, that's the thing, though, right, is um, I think it's all about attitude. And I've kind of <laughs> taken that approach to weather in the last several years and uh, it changes everything. So so glad to hear you mention that. Nerdsy, you are now kind of a, a a new thing for you, but a senior open source program manager at GitLab. Is that right? Yeah, I just joined at the beginning of this month, and I'm really excited to be part of this team, helping to um, really get more open source projects to join GitLab um, by helping them, you know, solve any issues that they have. Um, helping them with the migration process, all of that. So I love GitLab and I love open source. And so it's the perfect thing for me. What a nice match when you can um, combine a lot of things that you love. And we will get into that when we dive a little bit into your history. But uh, I would imagine, you know, being a month into GitLab, you're still kind of learning the ropes and getting to meet people and all of that stuff. But uh, has that been sort of nice getting to meet the people behind it? Yeah, it's the first time that I've been part also of a an all remote company. And I think that um, I was a little hesitant about it at first because I love meeting people and, you know, having those hallway conversations, coffee, you know, breaks out. Um, but GitLab has an amazing all remote culture. And so I've just been scheduling lots and lots of coffee chats with people, getting to know <laughs> as many as possible. And yeah, it has been great so far. Good for you. I actually love that term of um, remote culture. I, I admit that I haven't heard it before and that seems kind of silly considering I have my own remote culture considering I'm, you know, self-employed and all that stuff. But um, it seems to me like maybe that's what makes remote work successful or not, right? Is Is having the tools and having the people, but also, you know, you mentioned just scheduling coffee chats. And that sounds like, uh, even though maybe on the outside, it seems not mm, relevant to getting work done, I would imagine it's actually extremely important. Yeah, it is. Um, one of the things that GitLab does that's very different from other companies that I've been a part of is um, that mindset of being handbook first. And so they have, you know, very detailed documentation of everything, which is really good for that asynchronous, you know, just sharing of knowledge. Um, but, you know, it's one thing to look at a page and another thing to really meet the people behind it. And so, as you said, like, it's really important to have those relationships with the people behind it. Um, and, you know, like really knowing who to go to and like learning all of the little tips and tricks um, that you just can't find on a sheet of paper. So, yeah, big fan of coffee chats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you mentioned documentation in there, and I just want to quickly say that it's it's actually been a, a theme that has happened throughout the conversations I've had here on brunch. And I didn't expect that at first. Like for instance, the, the um, conversation I had recently with Heather uh, Ellsworth, um, she's a huge fan of documentation and how useful that is, but you're describing it sort of useful internally as well, which I love. Uh, but you're, you're absolutely right. Like maybe that's the first step, but having that human connection is almost the necessary second step uh, and the deeper, the deeper dive into understanding anything. So I, I really, uh, I love that idea of those scheduled coffee chats. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you're kind of new with the one month thing, but um, could you give us a little bit more of an understanding of what a senior open source program manager does on a daily basis? Have you figured that out yet? <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm in the process. But 
The first thing is that the program was set up um, because GitLab is an open core organization and a big part of um, just the culture there is to give back to the open source community. Um, And so they've tried to foster this in different ways. And one way was by providing um, open source projects with uh, access to their premium levels for free. And then also that's of the enterprise edition. And then they have a community edition that is fully free software. Um, The enterprise edition, you can do either like gitlab.com or your self-hosted instance. Um, And, you know, it has some proprietary software there too. Um, But the community edition is completely open source. So it's great for projects that are, you know, very concerned about the free software side of um, things or, you know, just fall further along that spectrum. Um, And so what I am supposed to be doing is helping to (laughs) really, uh, you know, grow that program because so far it's been very reactive and, you know, we have our internal processes set up to handle these requests and to start to assist large organizations like GNOME and KDE and Debian has also been one. There's still a lot of room for improvement, and it's my job to really go in and, you know, analyze the current program and start to fix little bits and pieces that, you know, could be fixed and really to start doing more of that outreach and, um, you know, letting people know that the program even exists. And that is my bread and butter. Like, I love doing that stuff. I love, you know, going in and finding challenges that need to be solved and then talking to lots of different people to figure out who I need to go to. Um, Also, the other thing that was really interesting about this is that everybody at GitLab um, seems to be new because they've just experienced so much growth in the last two years. Right. Um, A few people have said, you know, like they were there about a year and a half ago when it was about 250 people and it's now 1,200. And so there's this joke that you're there in the room or like, you know, the (laughs) video chat room (laughs) with people that are new to GitLab, newer to GitLab and new newest to GitLab. So (laughs) it is fun. (laughs) It's awesome. (laughs) But yeah, I never feel like out of place as the new person because everybody is like that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's actually really nice. Yep. I would imagine too that um, there's quite a bit of like great energy considering that people are new. Um, I know oftentimes that newness is actually a really great feature. Yes, exactly. It's really, really awesome to be um, at a company with so with people from all sorts of different backgrounds. Some people who haven't really been part of the open source world or haven't been part of the DevOps tools world, and you know they bring in their own expertise. And um, you know, there's I I love thinking about diversity in all its forms, and you do see you know lots of different types of thought diversity. Um, and, you know, again, it's my first month there and I've already heard that, you know, there are ways that GitLab are are trying to continue to constantly like build out other types of diversity or just in general, like be a more diverse organization. But my experience so far has been really awesome with that. And it comes from, as you say, like a bunch of new people coming in from different areas and, you know, working on this common product. That sounds really amazing as an environment to try to do some of your best work. I heard you there earlier get a little bit excited about the people aspect of things when you were describing it. I would imagine that's actually a lot of fun too, because it sounds like you're kind of reaching into a whole bunch of different communities. How's that been? I haven't done as much community work at GitLab yet because I'm first focusing on kind of like the infrastructure part. Um, so right now when I was talking about, you know, talking to lots of different people, it was all internally. Um, and this comes along with trying to streamline the processes better. I have to, you know, better understand the different teams that will touch my project or that would be interested in my project and find ways for us to better collaborate. And 
an example, like a tangible example of this is that the way, like we really dog food our project. And so all of my organization for my program, which is, I love dog fooding things. I do it. Ah, it's, it's great. <laughs> like I actually don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Okay. <laughs> dog fooding <laughs> is basically other people also refer to it as like, we drink our own wine. So it's basically um, eating your own. <laughs> huh. Now that I can't explain it. Okay. I know the term. It means you <laughs> use your own products, but why is it dog fooding? <laughs> mm, maybe a follow up question for me the next time. <laughs> we can go with it. I still really like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Anyway, the point is that I use GitLab for my daily work, and this is great because I'm not an engineer, and so it's a tool that can really be used by lots of different people. Um, and and that was actually part of the reason why I was so excited about it in the first place is that I've tried all sorts of different tools, and this is the one where I could see lots of different teams actually using. And so um, – Back to my tangible example, um, I have a label called open source that I work with, but it was only part of the community relations project. And so I'm now promoting it to like the top level so that everybody can use it within the organization. And this is my way to start to really be able to um, promote the work that I'm doing internally so that people know to come to me when they need help or um, just in general to get more awareness about the program that I'm building. Keep the dog food flowing. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you describe that you have a chance to use GitLab for yourself, what for you are sort of the features that really stand out in your current workflow? Because I, I would imagine, you know, some of us listening don't necessarily have experience with GitLab yet. So especially in a non sort of developer uh, capacity. So what is it about you that, that really grabs you about it using it on a daily basis? I think that in the roles that I've been, I have had to work with engineers. I sometimes very heavily, sometimes not as heavily um, at Endless, which I'm sure I'll talk about later. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it was, um, yeah, working with engineers to develop like applications or to um, create um, like a beta, beta testing program or, um, you know, various initiatives that required a lot of direct work with engineers. And I worked very cross-functionally. So at Endless, we decided to actually go with Fabricator. Um, which is another project management tool. And when we tried to show it to the design team, <laughs> they like ran away crying. And that's <laughs> not to say <laughs> that Fabricator isn't a lovely tool. It's just that the interface of it is not as easy to use, or it's not as intuitive, and it's not as beautiful as um, some of the other uh, tools that we were evaluating. And so when we went with Fabricator for like utility at Endless, um, our design team was just, you know, not super pleased. <laughs> so, um, you know, eventually they, they were able to um, adopt it and everything. But I think that um, at GitLab, that's why it, at Gnome was one of the first like big projects to um, migrate over to using GitLab. Um, and that was partly just to consolidate their tools and use a single platform um, as part of the newcomer story so that people didn't have to start signing up for all sorts of different tools. And again, part of it was like that ease of use and being able to attract a lot of newcomers. And I just, I, I fell in love with the product because it was usable and it had all the same functionality um, when you asked about like specific features the Kanban boards and labels, milestones, or like being able to set dates and assign tasks to people, all of the same things that I had liked about things like Trello or um, Basecamp or Asana. In my mind, those are some of the more like um, user-friendly project management ones that aren't as commonly used for engineering teams and so I, I just really saw GitLab as something that provided a little bit of something for everybody. At GNOME, my focus was 
on the engagement team and helping to grow the community and to also evangelize for other skill sets and, you know, like just in general diversity that kind of mentioned that as a theme that I'm really interested in. And I saw it as, you know, a tool that people could start using, even if they weren't um, very familiar with engineering tools and practices. And even if somebody joined the engagement team just to do marketing type work, they could start to get to familiar with a tool and then feel, build that confidence so that if they could then wanted to start dabbling in some of the more like, um, you know, either documentation or some um, more like code contribution type work, then they were at least familiar with the tool and could, you know, transition more easily to that. So those are, I guess, the reasons why <laughs> I get excited about it. A great many good reasons. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. It sounds super powerful. I admit I don't have experience with it, but now I'm itching to get some. <laughs> so that's a good sign. Yeah, it's really pretty. <laughs> you mentioned in there um, some of your experience uh, working with the GNOME team, and I know you've been quite involved there. Can you walk us through that? Sure. So I first got involved through my work at Endless. Um, and just kind of quick background on that. Endless is a company that was started back in 2012. I was one of the people who helped start it. Um, and we at Endless, we were building a Linux-based desktop. We first launched it on our own hardware, um, but Endless was designed for to reach people who didn't have great internet connection, perhaps no internet connection, or were new to computers. And so we're really all about simplifying the Linux desktop experience to make it easy for your grandmother to use, you know, or anybody like your two-year-old daughter, <laughs> anybody. Um, and so uh, we started to, you know, really... Uh, contribute upstream. We, we were a GNOME-based desktop. And so we were contributing very heavily upstream to GNOME. And I was invited to one of the initial, uh, one of the annual conferences. Um, it was in Sweden. I was super excited to go to Sweden. Mm, lucky you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I got to speak about, you know, um, some of the ways that we had changed the designer um, when designing for our audience considerations that you had to have. And so, you know, I, I, first of all, loved the atmosphere of the community. They were all very welcoming, very, um, you know, I, I didn't feel like an outsider. That is so important too, right? Because if you're, if you're trying to make any change or recommendations or, or trying yes. to collaborate with anyone, that is a necessity to be sort of welcomed with open arms and to be, um, yeah, collaborative. Um, so that is very good to hear. Yeah. I think especially I, I had never been to an open source conference before. I, as I said, I'm not an engineer. And so I had a lot of, um, he not hesitation, but I, I just wasn't sure how I would be received as a as a mm. non engineer at this conference. Um, most of my colleagues going were all engineers and had been part of the open source world. So here I was, like non engineer, new to open source. <laughs> like let's do this, <laughs> and it was great. Like people were so nice, and they were you know willing to explain things to me, and I just I got really excited about it. And, you know, the whole thing is that when I first started learning about open source software and really helping to figure out which applications to pre-install on Endless OS, I was one, amazed by how many awesome applications there were available. I had no idea coming from like a Windows and Mac background that the Linux application ecosystem even existed. <laughs> so I was like, wow, I don't have to pay for Photoshop. This is great. Like, let's do GIMP and Inkscape. And it's an enabler, isn't it? Right. And and for Endless, that's the whole idea is to enable um, creativity and access and all of that stuff. So what a beautiful thing. Exactly. And while I was so excited about like the practicality of all these applications, 
I was a little less <laughs> excited about how they looked and they felt. And you've already kind of heard me get excited about how pretty GitLab is. Like this is a reoccurring theme in my life is that I like beautiful things. And I, you know, you, I'm all about experiences too. Like when I, um, I really value experiences. And so it's like, um, at, unless I think they said like pixels don't cost anything. So like, let's make this really luxurious and let's make it feel super high quality so that our users, even if they can't afford, you know, thing, lux luxury items, you know, they feel like this is a luxury item. Um, and, and that's really what I wanted, you know, like I care a lot about the usable, the usability and the experience. And I, I felt so, um, hopeful for how the Linux application ecosystem could keep evolving to have that in mind. And for that, that's why I got really excited about the diversity, diversity of thought, diversity of like lots of different aspects um, so that, you know, you could really create software that was not only functional, but a delight to use. And so that's how I sort of got plugged into the GNOME community um, at the time, the engagement team was just a few people. And so, um, really was excited about joining that and helping to grow the team and start advocating for like caring more about our brand and marketing and, um, outreach and, um, building a community, all of that stuff. And I guess they found it valuable <laughs> and, uh, I was asked to, um, run for the board of directors. Wow. Yeah. And I ended up serving three terms. Um, and during that time at the, when I first joined, we didn't have an executive director. So I helped with that hiring process. And a lot of my strength is in project management and really driving things forward. So I was able to bring that in. And then, you know, we went through the whole restructuring of our organization because as we started to care more about the newcomer's experience and about, you know, like really caring about our community. Um, and actually for us, the move to GitLab was a huge part of that because it was in, you know, completely changing our tools to be more modern and, you know, easy for newcomers to join. That's when we started getting more donations and more like publicity. And there were a lot of like little things and big things that happened. Um, Ubuntu changed uh, to, uh, came back to us as um, uh, having GNOME as the default. Um, and we ended up having, you know, more newcomers join. And it was just a very, um, like momentous <laughs> period for us. And during all that time, we had to change a lot of the way that the foundation was running because we went from having one employee to having seven employees. And for us, that was a historical record. We'd never hired anyone outside of our um, director of operations and executive director uh, full-time. And so now we're able to, you know, help not only keep the GNOME community healthy, but start dreaming even bigger than we ever had before. And yeah, it's been an exciting time. Oh, it sounds exciting. <laughs> you must feel, you know, I, I'm, I'm going back to your describing sort of that, that feeling of showing up at that very first conference and not really knowing if you're going to sort of fit in. Um, and then, you know, fast forward to that moment you just described as, as being, you know, helping to form what is really, uh, an exciting time for the GNOME com community and the foundation. And, uh, it sounds like those have really been catalysts to a lot of positive change in many communities around. So that must be, <laughs> it must feel really good for you to be a part of that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I'm always amazed, um, at, you know, again, going back to kind of experience it at events, um, I see events as like the lifeblood of a lot of open source communities because it's the time when, you know, you get your core members together to work on things or it's a place to draw in newcomers and to really have that in-person touch point that will carry on throughout the year when you're all remote. Um, and and yeah, I just think that it's something that sometimes people don't value as much, but there's so much value in creating awesome events and experiences for people. Um, 
and it's something that, you know, in addition to all my other interests, <laughs> I'm, I feel really excited about. So <laughs> you're a multifaceted human being. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I get pulled into lots of projects. <laughs> yeah. Well, you probably allow yourself to. It sounds like you uh, you, you jump in full, full swing. <laughs> and so maybe that's a really nice segue then. Um into your efforts with the Libre Application Summit. Um, it sounds like that brings together a lot of your efforts all into one place. And I'm actually admit to not being that familiar with what happens on the ground at the Libre Application Summit. So um, what's it like there? How are you involved? What are the people like? I'm sure they're amazing, but uh, give us a sense of it. We started the, um, we used to call it Lost Gnome, and that was when it was Libre Application Summit, um, as a way to really move forward the experience behind Linux applications. Um, and we had a couple of iterations of that, and then KDE expressed an interest in also participating in the organization of it. And, you know, it was something that to me was made a lot of sense where, you know, we're only going to be able to move the dial on this if we're working together strategically and, you know, able to provide um, big organizations with sort of a, a united front um, where we say like, these are the options and we we're, we're really seen as a collaborative community as opposed to, you know, like each doing their own thing and um, having a lot of segmentation. Yeah. It sounds like breaking down some of those perceived sort of rivalries is um, really beneficial, even, even if, you know, that's not the reality, but there's been a lot of um, sense that, oh, these two camps can't collaborate, but that I think has been, at least from my perspective, one of the the greatest gifts that has come out of uh, Libre Application Summit, and and you've described that as really meaningful too. Yes, exactly. I, you know, before um, really getting involved in the Libre Application Summit, I well now uh, what I was going to say is that we rebranded to instead of Lost Gnome Libre Application Summit hosted by Gnome, we rebranded to Linux App Summit. Um, and that's the more like neutral version so that, you know, we can have both GNOME and KDE be the hosts and also, you know, continue to evolve it. Um, we're still not sure how far the evolution will go, if it'll become its own organization at some point, or if it will continue to be co-hosted by KDE and GNOME. Um, there's still, you know, uh, lots of room for growth and, and discussion. But yeah, before uh, my involvement with that, I didn't really know many KDE people. I think I knew one from a, a conference, two from a conference in Brazil, <laughs> and they were great. And But they expressed, too, that they were really interested in doing more with GNOME. And um, that sort of planted the seed in my mind of, you know, I have to get to know more KDE people. I'd really like to understand areas where we can collaborate. And this just naturally made sense. Um, they were incredible to work with. Um, I worked very closely with Alish Pohl, the, the current president, um, and they were just so supportive and collaborative. And um, yeah, I think that we, because of them, we were able to double attendance um, and to uh, have much more of an outreach than we had in previous years. So lots of great things. That must feel amazing to be part of all that. <laughs> I'm sitting here just like jaw dropped at at, at how important that stuff is, uh, and bringing people together, and uh, just seeing what comes out the other end when you combine some, you know, really some people doing some great work all in the same room. What a gift! <laughs> Can I ask you how it is that you ever came to the tech world in the first place? Because it sounds to me like you have a big heart for the sort of the human aspect of it and and uh, organizing people and organizing projects. But how did you come to tech uh, in the beginning? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, let's see. When I was younger, I thought I'd be a doctor, honestly. <laughs> and then it's a good choice. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was the thing is it was through a lot of exploration. Um, actually, in high school, I interned at a hospital. Don't ask me why they let me in as a high schooler, but they did. And it was, it was, uh, you know, at, at a children's hospital, at the Stanford Children's Hospital. And I just 
my heart broke because I didn't like seeing children when they were sick. I wanted to do something to prevent that. And that was sort of the reoccurring theme also within the different internships or programs that I tried out where I also thought that, you know, I might become a lawyer. And, um, I, I interned at an immigration law clinic and I just had so many stories of, you know, heartbreaking stories of people battling through immigration stories. And I just, you know, it was, it was something where I didn't want to fight at that level. I wanted to fight at the higher level of like, how can we, how can I prevent this from happening? Or how can I like do a deeper level? I just felt kind of helpless in that situation. So anyway, I I graduated with an international relations major and a minor in psychology, and that still goes along with my interest in people all around the world. And growing up in Silicon Valley, you know, you're just surrounded by tech. And what I really love about it is how it's almost like a superpower where just a few people can create something that can enormously impact other people's lives. And this is kind of a, an extreme and, you know, not the best example, but the person who created Flappy Birds <laughs> then was like used by so many people. <laughs> and it's just, you know, uh, still like the the core concept is that a person can create something that can touch so many lives. And so that was really where I saw, okay, well, if I want to make a huge impact on this world, you know, I really do see tech as that tool of reaching people. And I know like there are social ramifications of technology. That was something that I was really aware of also, but that was even more reason to join because I care about these things. I care about cultural sensitivity and about making sure that you're not forcing technology to people or saying that, you know, that it's, it's better than their way of life. And so those are the the human aspects that I think should be infused in technology. Um, because after all, technology is just a tool to help you improve your life. So I really see it in that lens. It's a means for us to express ourselves, right? Yeah. Yeah. That is actually, you know, the reason that I came to open source in the first place was hitting pause on sort of my interest in um, the technical aspects, because that's easy for me to get into uh, the way my mind works. Um, but then hitting pause and using my heart to say, well, how does this change people's lives? And it sounds like you spent a lot of time and effort and energy thinking about that throughout your years as well. And what amazing things we can do when we use that as a guiding light, especially in the world of technology. Yes. And, you know, what you say, how it draws you towards open source, I think that's been the biggest kind of um, twist in my journey. I never, I I didn't know what open source was. And then now I find myself really interested in it and having it be something that, you know, is really guiding my path forward. And it has to do with what you said of really, you know, like the people aspect of things and, um, Something I didn't share about my background earlier is that both of my parents are from Mexico and I had grown up, you know, really like going back and, and just seeing so many things that I wanted to fix there, um, or help, you know, challenges that I wanted to help solve. And it was as simple back then as my dad wanted to go visit his mom and would you know, wanted to find the cheapest way to get there. And we knew that there were buses, but there was no information online about bus schedules or train schedules or anything. And so, you know, like having a simple website (laughs) would have helped my dad, but also probably lots of other people. And, um, you know, the cost of setting up a website could be difficult or, or, you know, uh, prohibitive for some people. And so now there are tools to allow that. And, there's obviously a difference between free software, um, free of cost software and free software in the philosophical sense of free to reuse, modify, um, do whatever you'd like with it. 
you know, I think that the, the being able to do whatever you want with it is so powerful because it really allows somebody to not have to do something from scratch, but really build upon somebody else's work and, and to continue to focus on the pro- problem as opposed to have to deal with some of the more logistical effort in solving that challenge. So anyway, I really, um, have been drawn to the open source movement as a result of my family background, even, and just kind of the the hopes and dreams that I have for making a difference in the world. Yeah. It sounds like it necessarily touches a deep place in you. And yet that's also the place where you get a lot of your courage and a lot of your motivation to, to make those differences. Do you feel like with your experience working in Endless and helping create what Endless has become, do you feel like you've achieved that in some ways? Or do you feel like you got to see that uh, firsthand in some instances? Yeah. You know, I was really involved in all steps of that. And so, you know, one of the coolest things was going out into the field. We had this policy where Um, They wanted everybody in the company to go to our target markets and meet our users and really hear from them. And that was so rewarding because you could see how people who normally shied away from technology or didn't see how it could really benefit them, really see how it could be a huge enabler. And, um, you know, for example, there was in, in Guatemala, one of the things that is difficult is that um, children are being required to do homework um, and research things on the internet. And because most, a lot of children in in rural areas don't have, um, you know, internet connections at home, they have to go to a computer lab and, or, you know, internet cafe and um, pay for that. But because their parents aren't able to support the cost of sending, you know, five children to do reports on, you know, at internet cafes, sometimes they're unable to complete their homework. And then, you know, they end up having to drop out of school. And so having a computer that has a lot of preloaded information and just had like the 80% of the most um, search for articles for that particular country um, preloaded, and it had a lot of other resources, again, completely available offline. And something as simple as that could really be a game changer and help people, you know, be able to continue to to go to school. Um, So I saw lots of these different um, stories and, and, you know, ways that our technology was really impacting people's lives. Um, And when you ask me, you know, did we accomplish everything? I think I always, in all that I do, I really try to have both a micro and macro level of um, impact where I really try to do things immediately for my family, for my friends. But then I also like to dream big and think about the billions of people. How can I serve there? And, you know, so for those instances, like I saw some real impact even there. Um, However, we really hit some challenges when we were trying to expand. Um, I think that our business model didn't completely work and we had to shift to try to, you know, find ways um, to gain traction in different countries. And we just hit, were hit again and again with how, um, you know, especially Microsoft is really good at business development. And we often found that if we had started up, you know, to talk to a government or something like that, then, oh, actually our project got canceled and, oh, something with Microsoft happened. And not to say that, you know, there was any shady business or anything, but it just shows that they are a huge player and they're doing something right where they're really going out and spending, uh, like they have the network there to really continue to grow. And um, for a small company that was, you know, trying to also get more people to see the value in Libre Office as opposed to Microsoft Office, it was tough. And it just, unfortunately, we weren't able to do as much globally as we wanted to. So the company shifted to um, focus on 
the hack computer, which is to, um, it's st still endless OS, but it's now more designed to help children learn more about open source software and to start programming. There's like a really cool game where they can, um, start to, uh, well, it's, it's a game, but they, it ends up like helping them modify applications within their own computer and, it's just, it's really cool. And so, you know, shifted strategy to really help the next generation uh, see the benefits of open source software, which I think is still a really awesome thing to do. But yeah, so when you ask again about like, did I reach the goals that I wanted to with Endless? I would say um, my goal in, in touching people's lives, definitely. Um, and I would have, you know, I, I wish that it, it had been wildly successful in the global outreach part. So, well, and that's the thing like that is a massive hope to reach, you know, uh, very large groups of people and make a difference in the world. Just that word, um, you know, that's trying to reach more than just your neighbors, right? And um, so to have that sort of as your horizon allows you to accomplish some really amazing things um, while you're doing the work. But so I don't think you should necessarily um, be too hard on yourself because it sounds like you made some really profound impacts on even a few individuals that you had experience with. But uh, it seems to me like, you know, I heard years ago about Endless OS. And so even someone like me who was reading about it because I cared about the, some of these same topics, just knowing that Endless uh, was out there doing some of that important work feels like a real success uh, overall. And I think that the lasting impact too is our contributions upstream to GNOME and just in the various um, technologies that we touched, um, really advocating for making it really user-friendly for reaching an audience beyond just, you know, engineers or technical users um, and really pushing that um, upstream in a, in a, you know, community that I think had predominantly technical users or basically face that type of an audience. So um, I'm really happy to see some of those changes. I think um, one big thing was um, Flatpak and Flathub um, really having like a store, a place where people could go to find applications in one single area. Um, we were, of course, not the only ones that contributed to that. Um, in fact, it was led by others, but we contributed heavily towards that and shared our knowledge of, you know, usability testing and all that kind of stuff to help improve it and make it really usable. So, yeah, uh, lasting contributions. <laughs> <laughs> they sound quite lasting. And those are the kind of things that just kind of inform the future. I know you're using um, Endless OS for some of your daily work as well. Is that right? Yeah, I still use it as my personal computer. I just, I love how simple it is to use. <laughs> Lovely. And yeah, it's something that I can, you know, show any of my friends and family and have them instantly be like, oh, cool. Like that makes sense. <laughs> so, yeah. And so would you say, you know, for those listening, um, is it approachable by anyone, even if it was designed maybe for a specific purpose, but it sounds like the design energy that went into it was to try to just make it friendly for humans, period. Uh, do you feel like that's true? Yes, definitely. And I think that one of the big things is that it uses OS tree, which basically makes um, the updating process really easy. Again, I can't delve into the technical details behind all of this, but um, one of the things that initially kind of scared me from Linux in general was having to deal with um, command line to do anything. <laughs> and yeah, that's a fairly common fear, right? <laughs> yes. So, you know, even just that um, was a huge one for us. And um, it's something that, you know, in certain cases, like we've seen a lot of people who want to bring um, open source software to schools or to communities that uh, would benefit from the technology. 
and and it's just something that they can leave there and and not worry about people like breaking or you know like not being able to update and uh, it's just it's super easy and this makes me think about like the adoption process and we're often compared to um, one laptop per child. And um, one of the things that we learned from that project is that if you bring technology to a new area and you don't teach the the professors, the, the teachers to to use it, oftentimes the, pro- the, the technology will fail because the teachers don't know how to use it. And so they, they don't necessarily encourage the students to use them or, you know, they might even not use the technology because it's embarrassing or any other reason. And so um, one of the things that uh, we tried to do in when we were trying to get more people to use it was to also invest in the training programs. But we found that it was also, it was already really easy for people to use, but it was more so about like, helping people understand the utility of using a computer because sometimes they didn't even like think that it was relevant to them. So that was really fascinating for me. Naritz, is there a question uh, that you would put to our audience? Uh, Or it doesn't even need to be a question. It could be something you'd like them to go see or something you want them to experience or think about even. I would just say that, you know, there's so much buzz around diversity and inclusion. And I know that people have different thoughts and feelings about this. Overall, people seem to agree that diversity is important. Um, However, you know, there are people who, um, who are not as enthusiastic about the methods to, to reach this. What I would like to stress is that it's about experiences and how you make people feel and about really trying to connect with others and understand other people's perspectives. And I think that if we keep that in mind, that's really what's going to help us create better products. And that will sort of naturally lead to diversity and inclusion. Um, That's not to say that we shouldn't put in effort into programs that will help foster that. Um, but just as we're creating these programs to really think about that experience um, that people are having. And so, you know, we all care about technology. And I think that if we keep in mind that human-centered focus, that that's really where we're going to uh, create magic. So I like magic. Um, I do too. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> if people wanted to connect with you then, uh, wherever they reach you. I have lots of different ways to be contacted, but um, my personal email is probably the best way to go because I, the, my GNOME one's having a little bit of problems these days. I can't send mail from it. So um, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, it's Naritzi, S at gmail.com. My name is really difficult. So N as in Nancy, U, R, I, T as in Tom, Z as in Zebra, I, S as in Sam at gmail.com. And I'm also on Telegram as Naritzi, my first name. That's great. I'm sure that'll be plenty for ways (laughs) for people to connect. So thank you. Um, Yeah, I want to also say thanks for connecting with me. Um, We've had a lot of fun during this chat, um, and I hope we can get connected in the future too. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure speaking with you, Brent. So thank you. Thank you too for your time and for giggling with me and all of those (laughs) great things. So uh, we'll, we'll chat again soon. Sounds great. 